conflicts of interest, I'm, I'm a chair at the University of Newcastle. I'm chair of something called ECA, European Cannabis Holdings. We run cannabis clinics in the UK when we're able to start. Um, we have a difficulty getting through the bureaucracy of a name, a naming list to start. I run this thing called the Academy of Medical Cannabis, which is an online teaching program, which would be very welcome. Some of you may have seen it. It's free, uh, 12 basic modules, about 20 minutes each. Um, and another certificate at the end of that, you could have you know, two certificates out of this. Um, and we run the medical, uh, we've set up a new thing called the Medical Cannabis Clinicians Society, um, which I'm chair of. We have actually about 100 doctor members of that now, so that's, that's good. Uh, it's very, very new. The whole thing's very, very new. So that basically is me. Uh, and I think I've been through what the, the program is. So let's have a look at the history. Um, again, maybe note here, this was, cannabis uh, was first known to be in existence as a medicine uh, about 5,000 years ago. This slide is slightly underdone, about 5,000 years ago, if not more. And it was uh, originated probably in uh, China around the Himalaya area, and then spread, basically put it very crudely, then spread, uh, which way is that, uh, westwards um, over the course of the next several millennia uh, to arrive in Europe, actually reasonably recently in that turn in the Middle Ages, having gone through India and the Middle East in the process, and then moving, actually again, relatively recently um, in, in uh, overall terms across the Atlantic into North and then South America. So it has a very, very long history as a medicine. And this guy um, was the first description of using cannabis. And I think the next slide tells us a little bit more. He was the Emperor Shen Nong, the first known medical recommendation for cannabis. And he introduced it along with a lot of other techniques such as uh, acupuncture. He's the sort of father of uh, Chinese medicine, if you like. And uh, he, used, uh, he produced a sort of um, pharmacopoeia, which, in, which focused particularly on cannabis, particularly using cannabis uh, for pain and also for glaucoma, which is more uh, fundamental starting points. So that was, oh, what does that say? I can't read the thing on this slide. That was um, 2,337 before Christ. So that's, yeah, that's about roughly 5,000 years ago as a, as a history, as a medicine. As I said, it was on the list of Chinese medicines, treated as well, I've just said, gout, as well as malaria. I don't know if it has much efficacy for malaria, but it was used for malaria. Uh, rheumatism, pain, forgetfulness, uh, a whole variety of things that we still use today. I don't think we use it much for gout or malaria, but we use it for the other things. So that was its origins. That's the first question of the exam, by the way. It's just a, I've got to indicate what the exam is by holding a hand up when you've got a note a point particularly. Um, and then it was used in uh, Egypt, but now looking, we're zooming through the millennia here, about 1500 BC, uh, it was used, and uh, one of these days somebody in the audience is going to say, I know about hieroglyphics, and that doesn't say cannabis at all, but as I'm presuming, unless anyone cares to correct me, but actually no one here knows about hieroglyphics either, so that word there says cannabis. <laughs> and it was on the Ibis papyrus, and it was describing the use of a cannabis poultice as a vaginal suppository for pain, probably to the menstrual uh, cramping. There's a lot, a lot, you could go on for an hour or more showing all the historical use of cannabis leading up to, this is another one, I just like this, uh, Herodotus of Halicarnassus, uh, now looking, getting closer, about 450 BC now. I just like that description. The Scythians enjoy it so much they howl with pleasure. Obviously that was not for uh, medical use, but I just like the quote. Um, and I, I'm saying there's something wrong with that. If anyone knows this, if they use hemp seed, that does not contain phytocannabinoids. So I don't know what they were using, um, but I'll ignore that slight error. Uh, that's what he said. So presumably he was using some part of the hemp plant. Yes. Cannabinoids stick to the seed. Ah, there you go. Yeah. The Thank you very much. So it's not the seed, it's the stuff that sticks on the seed. Thank you. Perfect. I've always looked for that explanation. That's very kind. Thank you very much. With this guy called William Brooke O'Shaughnessy, I made a huge mistake once of giving a talk in Ireland and called him English, and he is actually Irish. That was very quickly pointed out to me. Although he did, he lived in India. He noticed the use of uh, hemp, as they called it there, uh, for various uh, Indian or ailments in the local population, and brought it back to the UK. He brought it back to the UK, not Ireland, and introduced uh, 
this medicine to the British Isles called Squire's Extract. But then it was really a very totally acceptable uh, medicine. And this is Sir William Bosler, I'm sure it's familiar to you, who the father so-called of modern medicine. So cannabis indica is the most satisfactory remedy. He was talking about migraine, so yet another thing. He was perfect, it was a perfectly acceptable uh, form of medicine. And the, everyone says the story of Queen Victoria, so I can't not do that. And uh, Sir so John Russell Reynolds, who was the physician to Queen Victoria, uh, used it on Queen Victoria, uh, as, far as, we, uh, as far as I know, it may be, may be not true, but I like to think it is, uh, for Queen Victoria's menstrual cramping as well. So it had a very regal um, start in life, really. Um, pain was its main indication, as it is now. Most prescriptions are now for about 70% of prescriptions for pain. And it was a perfectly accepted medicine up to about the 1920s, early 1930s. There's a few pictures there. It happened to be based from America, but it doesn't matter about the use of cannabis as a perfectly acceptable medicine. Um, like that. 100 separate illnesses. Diseases were listed as potentially uh, treated by cannabis in the US pharmacopoeia. And then this came along. This was the start of the demonization of cannabis. This was the uh, second opium conference in Geneva. Uh, and this was to look at global controls over narcotics, basically. But I think to everyone's surprise, and the original transcript is no longer in existence for this, but everyone's surprise, a delegate from Egypt, note, um, uh, call that guy, uh, said that uh, we, they ought to include cannabis into this uh, restriction of narcotics, which it isn't. Um, I think uh, the story goes that no one was expecting this, no one was able to uh, say this was not true. Hashish was at least as harmful as opium, if not more so. No one argued about that, and lo and behold, as a result of that conference, cannabis was included um, in the restricted drugs as a result of that conference. And it was sort of downhill from there, pushed further downhill by this guy, Harry Anslinger who was, uh, again, that's a very interesting story. He was the first commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, the, the counterpart to J. Edgar Hoover, who was the commissioner of the Federal Bureau of the FBI. Um, prohibition was ending, and the, the funds flowing into the uh, Federal Bureau of Narcotics were drying up, so Anslinger thought he better have some other campaign to keep his staff and to keep his budgets, um, and came up with an anti uh, cannabis campaign called marijuana. That was the first use of marijuana um, around then. It was an appalling campaign that was uh, anti-Mexican and anti-black, highly racist campaign, and, and appalling really, supported by uh, um, Randolph, what was he called, J. Randolph Hearst, the newspaper magnate, and a very successful uh, anti-cannabis, anti-marijuana campaign was fought by these two, purely for political reasons. There was no truth in any of the uh, stuff they were producing. And I'll let you read that. Uh, that's the sort of stuff that was coming out from Harry Anslinger. As an aside, um, to show you the power of social media, the, the Academy of Medical Cannabis, we originally called the Anslinger Institute, tongue in cheek, not surprisingly. We thought Anslinger would be turning in his grave to think we named a teaching cannabis institute after him. But there was such a social media backlash that we can't possibly name our academy after a racist. Uh, I think that social media lacks irony sometimes, doesn't it? I think that some people are thinking we actually named it after this guy to, 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 to celebrate him, yeah. without missing the fact he was completely the other way around. But anyway, after quite a lot of social media, uh, we, did, we couldn't carry on, so it's no longer the Ansley Academy, which I think is a pity. Anyway. These are some of the things, this was the realm, this is what it said, murder, insanity, and death. It was, uh, you know, way, way over the top, but people believed it. And that is still in our mindset, to be honest, or some people's mindset. The famous film, um, somebody told me recently this had been remade. I don't know if anyone has seen the, the, re, the rehash of Reefer Madness. No, it's uh, it, apparently worth seeing. It's, uh, the original was so awful. It's one of those things that you really ought to see because it's so awful. Um, drug crazed abandon. Actually, that doesn't sound too bad for some people, but anyway. Um, then it was placed on the most restrictive schedule. It was Schedule 4 of Schedule 1, if anyone is interested in the detail. Uh, their drugs are particularly liable to abuse, abuse ill effects, and such liability is not offset by substantial therapeutic advantages. The same category as synthetic opioids, and it was a more restrictive category than cocaine and opium. 
And of course, those who signed up to the UN single convention, uh, that then resulted between five and 10 years later in the various misuse of drugs acts that are now prevalent worldwide. And I think your misuse of drugs act was about 1973, something like that. Ours in the UK was 1971. And then it's remained under mainly what we call Schedule 1 of the Misuse of Drugs Act until very recently, which was um, by definition meant that cannabis had no medicinal value and should not be used. You could just about get a license for research, but it's very difficult to do. Until November of this year, last year, when it was moved uh, in certain restrictive categories to Schedule 2, which means it can be prescribed by doctors. I'm going to deal with that right at the end of the day just to compare what you might be doing here with the U UK regulations. So in a nutshell, that's the history of cannabis. Uh, there's a lot more to it than that, and it's a lot more interesting than that. Uh, it's, uh, it's a, there's a very good few uh, books on the subject for those interested. It's been a fascinating um, history of uh, cannabis to get up to the modern era. And it really is only in the last, well, some states in the, in the United States have been about 10 years now legal, I think, roughly speaking. But really, it's in the last two or three years that the, the, the wave of um, legalizing in various ways or decriminalizing in some countries has come, at least for medical purposes. And it's now legal in 50 countries as of today in various shapes and guises uh, for medical use. I'll come to that point at the end as well. Okay, anything on the history? That's the first bit done. Okay with that? Okay with that. Good. Now, endocannabinoid system. This is challenging for me, as I'm not a neuroscientist. Now, who is a neuroscientist in this room? A neuroscientist, not a... Okay, would you mind leaving for a short time? <laughs> well, you might know a lot more about this than I do. Uh, so I'm going to have a go at uh, talking about the cannabis system. I like this. I, we all produce cannabis. I, that's nice for the media. It's not strictly true, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's sort of an element of truth in it. Uh, that we, and when people say that it's, it's wrong and it, it's, it's evil or whatever, well, we all produce cannabis, or at least cannabis-like um, compounds in our own brain. So the endocannabinoid system, I was never taught at, at uh, medical school for the good reason I, uh, one talk I said it didn't exist at that point. Yes, it did exist at that point, just we didn't know it existed at that point. It's only really been known to, to its, its uh, history and its functions are being unraveled now. But it's from the 1990, 1990s that the endocannabinoid system and the cannabinoid receptors and, and the ligands were beginning to be uh, discovered. So it's quite recent, but nevertheless that's 20, 20 years. And it's still not taught in most medical, I don't know if it's taught in medical schools here, but I'm aware of one medical school in the UK, at Leeds, where it's now taught in the curriculum. Um, and I'm not aware it's now taught anywhere else, which I find just amazing, really. Whatever you think of cannabis for legal medical purposes, we should at least tell people about the endocannabinoid system, because it has a major role in, in many, many bodily functions. So let's, this is the guy who, uh, who uh, discovered or unraveled or published most about it, called Raphael Meshulam, who is Israeli. And he's still alive in his 80s and still talks. Uh, I've not met him, but the Israeli um, research was pioneering in getting this understood. So, the endocannabinoid system, very briefly, and again, forgive me if some of you know all this and think it's too simplistic, but I, I've got to plow through it. Um, we have at least two cannabinoid receptors, excitingly called one and two. Um, and probably, possibly, probably, I'm not sure, uh, three, currently GPR-55, and I think there may be one or two others of the GPR uh, system that may eventually be labelled as another cannabinoid receptor. And those receptors have key, two key main ligands that link to them and have the functions I'll go through in a moment, uh, mainly uh, anandamide and 2-AG. I won't try to pronounce these long uh, chemical names, but 2-AG I do, and I'm going to go through those functions in a moment. So the CB receptors, they're G-protein coupled cell membrane receptors like many others. Um, they act in summary, I'm going to show a more slide of this in a moment, by reducing the presynaptic neurotransmitter release there. So if you like a sort of negative feedback, I think is a fair description uh, that they calm down the, the um, release of other neurotransmitters by mechanisms I'll, I'll show in a moment. Um, I've already said, mainly in the brain and the lungs, etc., for CB1, CB2 mainly in the immune system, and there's probably others that we don't fully know about, and other ligands that we probably don't know about. So this, hopefully, 
Uh, this is from the internet. The internet's a wonderful thing, isn't it? You can get anything off the internet these days, so I don't make claims of writing this slide. But basically, if you look at the top, the classic um, presynaptic, postsynaptic, and the synaptic cleft in between, and or whatever comes down the, from the presynaptic neuron, it's got just an example of glutamate or GABA. There could be anything else like dopamine or serotonin or whatever that comes down. It crosses the synaptic cleft with the release of the neurotransmitter, links to the other side. Uh, and as soon as it's linked to the other side, and you get depolarization with increase of calcium, that triggers the production of the endocannabinoid ligand anandamide and 2AG. It's just anandamide on this slide to make it look simpler. That's made then, made to order, if you like. It's then released backwards across the synaptic cleft. It goes retrograde back to the synaptic cleft and links on to the cannabinoid receptors on the presynaptic terminal. So it goes backwards. It then, that then triggers a reduction in the release of the neurotransmitter in the first place. Uh, so that's very roughly what it does and how it does it. I don't think we need to go into too much of the science, but it's synthesized on demand, which I've said. This is anandamide. Anandamide is Sanskrit, by the way, for joy or bliss, which I think is a nice, uh, a nice title. Um, it's synthesized in response to depolarization induced rising calcium, but I said it's synthesized from that thing, but I will not try to pronounce, let's call it just NAEP, uh, via phospholipase D, NAEP PLD. If anyone's interested, that's what it is. I'm sure most being clinicians in the room aren't that interested in how what it's made by, but that is what it's made from. So they're broken up very quickly by something called fatty acid amide hydrolase, FAH, and it is a partial agonist of the CB1 and CB2 receptors. It also, importantly to note, doesn't confine itself to the CB receptors. It, it links to other receptors, which may be another mechanism of action, particularly, as it says here, uh, to the TRPV1 and the GPR55 receptors and others. And just out of a, a side there, um, after physical exercise, anandamide is meant to go up, it does go up, which is meant to be some of the thing for, um, uh, what do you call it, runners high. When I do some running, um, and I've never felt high after running. I just felt, <laughs> I just felt totally knackered after running. I thank God it's finished. Uh, so I think there's something fundamentally wrong with my endocannabinoid system. So I might benefit from cannabis. I think it's pushing it a bit to say chocolate has a similar effect as medical cannabis. But nevertheless, a nice story. If you don't want cannabis, then try chocolate. Um, 2 AG is perhaps a more uh, is uh, it doesn't again. I don't think it particularly matters what it's synthesised from, but that's what it is synthesised from. And it's broken down very, in fact, very similar, but slightly different chemical mechanisms. And that's a full receptor agonist, both CB1 and CB2. So it's probably, in that sense, a little bit more important, a little bit more of a role than anandamide. And also, we should remember, it's also an agonist for other receptors as well, which is important because of its um, widespread properties. Uh, anandamide and 2-AG synthesized cross backwards across the synaptic cleft to link with the CB and other receptors. And then, after it's done its action of reducing the presynaptic release of the neurotransmitters, it's quickly broken down into those two, uh, those uh, three chemicals by those, by those enzymes. So that's what, in a nutshell, that's what the endocannabinoid system is. More importantly, what does it do? Um, so let's look at the high level of what it does. It's selective inhibition of neural neurotransmitter release, as I've said. So it's sort of negative feedback. It has a homeostatic role in energy balance and metabolism. Across the whole spectrum, it affects adip adipocytes, hepatocytes, the GI tract, skeletal muscle, pancreas, insulin sensitivity, which therefore implies a role at least in obesity and diabetes, atherosclerosis, cardiovascular function. It has a role in stress response. It then regulates anxiety behavior. So it does a whole load of things. And some people will say, well, it's not, it's, it's not the snake oil. It can't do all this. But actually, when you think the endocannabinoid system is across the whole body and affects virtually all, if not all, neurotransmitter systems, it's not surprising that it has a, a major um, role in a lot of different systems. So what else does it do? It has clear its effect on memory. Um, it has an effect on appetite, mainly through CB1 receptors, probably. It's anti-inflammatory, quite a potent anti-inflammatory agent, uh, much more potent than aspirin and uh, steroids, in fact. Um, analgesic, through, probably through other receptors as well, a role in thermoregulation, and a role in sleep, promoting sleep and increasing REM sleep. I don't know if I break. Paul, are these slides going to be made? Where's he gone? 
going to be made available for people? Uh, yes. I don't mind if you're fine. You can have the. It's all 202. So if you want to keep, how the hell are we doing? It's 202 of these, so they can keep going. Um, we have got all day to get through them. Uh, so that's one thing. A range of things it does. What else does it do? It has an effect on motor control. Obviously, there's an effect on spasticity. We know about. It has a role in neurogenesis and neuroplasticity. Uh, therefore, it, can, it also has a role in protection after stroke and brain injury, for example. There's some evidence, for example, after, if people are on cannabis and have a brain injury, uh, they have less damage, if you like, as a, probably as a result of neuroprotection from the cannabis. Um, reduces tone in bladder, reduces motility and anti-inflammatory GI disorder, since its role in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Um, a role in female embryonic, uh, timing of embryonic implantation, so a role in female uh, reproduction, and it definitely, some of the cannabinoids definitely have anti-cancer roles. Its role in cancer per se is slightly more controversial, uh, but there's no doubt in animal models, and there are many, many anecdotes in the internet about its role in cancer in humans, uh, which I'll come to a bit later. Uh, but we shouldn't forget that if, even if we don't necessarily believe it's a human anti-cancer role, which I think it's too soon to be certain, um, it does have a, a role in cancer treatment, such as uh, anti-anxiety, and pain, and promoting sleep, promoting appetite, uh, affecting epilepsy and um, spasticity, if that's that the effect of that particular cancer. So it's a huge range of functions. So it's not surprising that the plant phytocannabinoids have a huge range of, of, of effects, if this is what the basic endocannabinoid system does. I think, yeah. I don't, this isn't my, somebody came up with this Relax, eat, sleep, protect, forget. It sounds like one of those rap things, doesn't it? Rap, eat, sleep, forget, protect, repeat. Um, I'm not too much into rap, as you might have gathered. It just says what I've just said. It has a role in all these immune functions, pain, pleasure, uh, mood, anxiety, appetite, memory, vomiting, GI tract, sleep. So, what's that got to do with the plant? Well, obviously, uh, there are three elements that interact with the endocannabinoid system. Our own brain-derived endocannabinoid system is on the left, and andamide and 2-AG, as I've said. And we shouldn't just forget, in passing, the synthetic cannabinoids that are... I don't know what's available in New Zealand, so forgive me. Uh, we have t uh, synthetic THC, dronabinol, and nabilone. We can prescribe nabilone in the UK, but not uh, dronabinol. What can you use here, any of those two? None of them. So you have no synthetic cannabinoids available for, pres for prescription. No. Okay. Um, I don't think they're much more good. I hope there's no, one, there's no moles from the industry here. Uh, I think generally synthetic cannabinoids uh, do a job, but they do it at the expense of significant side effects. And I, I don't personally think they're anything like as good and effective as the plant-based uh, cannabinoids, if you agree with that. But, uh, nevertheless, there are synthetic cannabinoids. Thank you. Round of applause. Excellent. We're warming. The audience is warming up. There's only one table though so far, so the rest of you've got a way to go. Um, I put this up as a question because I don't understand it. I mean, I, I'm sorry to. I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but I'm going to pick on the scientist again. You shouldn't have omitted this. So I, just, I just naively I look up, I mean, the anandamide top right, that's what it looks like, chemically speaking, interacts with the CB receptors, as we just said. But so does THC, which looks totally different to me. My naive view of, of, of neurochemistry says, well, why the hell does that thing look totally different from that thing interact with the same receptors? I would have thought it would look similar, chemically speaking, but it doesn't. I pose that as a question, and you're the only person who can answer it. Can you answer that question or not really? Uh, delta 9, CBD, and Delta 8 also all look very similar or congeners of each other. Uh, and Andamides, uh, obviously a, a long chain, so yeah. it's, uh, I can't actually answer, nor can science at this point. Why Good. I'm pleased that it can't, because it's me being stupid, but um, I, I just naively thought that the thing ought to look similar for it to interact with the same receptor, but clearly that's not true. Yes, sir? attaches to the receptor has to be the same, pretty much. Right. Basically, even though they're different, there may there'll be some part of that. Pump part of the receptor that's. Some part of that yeah. compound okay. that will attach to the attachment. That, so it's not the whole thing, it's a bit of it. Only so there might be a bit of it that could overlap. Yeah, that's a good explanation. Anyway, that's what they look like, I'm sure, is of limited interest to everybody, but I just raised that because it just struck me as a bit odd. 
Okay, that's the endocannabinoid system. How are we doing for time? Let me just keep an eye on the day. I'm going to get to this bit 10 to 11. Oh, I've got 35 miles ahead of myself. I'll slow down. Um, the plant, the phytocannabinoids, and the rest. So let's have a look at the plant. This is where it gets a bit more interesting. Uh, hopefully you're here to learn about the plant. And then, so let's see what happens. This is it. That's what it looks like. There's three um, botanists, any botanists in the audience? Because they argue endlessly about well, how many species of cannabis there are. I think there's three. Cannabis sativa, cannabis indica, and cannabis ruderalis. I think the difference is, is in medicine is becoming less and less important. There are crude differences. It's said that indica is more sedating, uh, so-called couch lock, whereas sativa is, uh, say, more uplifting, uh, more alerting, more creative, if you like. And I think that's probably generally true, but it's, it's a, a difference that's not particularly useful today because most of the medicines are hybrids between the two and it really I think depends much more on the THC CBD and the other cannabinoids in it and the terpenes in them rather than actually the, the species it comes from. Uh, ruderalis we don't hear about much but there are some medical uh, pombas that do have some ruderalis in them. Um, anyone know which is which? Yes? The small one looks like indica to me. It is. The tall one looks like sativa. Yeah, that's right. Sativa, for what it's worth, is grows quite uh, up to uh, six or seven meters. That's hugely tall. Um, indica is shorter and bushy-like, uh, for what it's worth. Uh, so that's the difference between them. So if you hear, and, uh, and it is relevant still in the, some of the case studies I'm going to look at. There are, um, from the licensed license producers, there are sativa dominant. Uh, medicines and indica dominant medicines that have a different role. I think though that, as I said, they will fade out the differences and we'll learn uh, to look more at the, the cannabinoid and the terpene profiles rather than actually where the, which plant it comes from, eventually. So... One, one theory is that yeah. uh, originally sativa meant cultivated, which yeah. had long stems for him, yeah. and indica meant from India, which was yeah. more intoxicating. Right, thank you. Yeah, and, and hemp, uh, thank you for reminding me of that. Uh, one sign of hemp later. Hemp is cannabis sativa. Um, so industrial hemp, which is confusing for people. People think hemp is different. It isn't. Hemp is cannabis. It is cannabis sativa. Long, tall stems used, or uh, well, I'll come to that in, in a bit, but used uh, for the strength of the stems, if you like, uh, for sails and paper and cloth in years gone by and biofood animals now and such like. So industrial hemp is a perfectly valid crop, very good crop. It is cannabis sativa. So let's just, uh, I'm, not, I'm not a grower. Um, so this is strange. Any growers here? I keep asking these questions. You're doing well so far. There's no, there's no expert in anything I'm meant to be an expert on, which is excellent. Quiet growers. Quiet growers. Oh, no. oh yeah, okay. No one's meant to be a grower. Okay, sorry about that. No one is a grower. No one knows anything about this at all. Nope. Excellent. But if, in case you're interested, there's a lot of seed, a lot of different seeds with a lot of different varieties. There's um, uh, Leafly, which is an excellent website, a very informative website called Leafly, uh, based in the States. Um, there's 2,520 odd strains of uh, cannabis there, all of which have different profiles, different variations of cannabinoids, different terpene profiles, different flavonoid profiles, which I'll come to in a moment. So. Um, there's a lot of seeds you can plant that will grow into very, very different um, medicines. And uh, it is, uh, as Paul said at the beginning, it's a family of medicines. I think that a lot of people don't know and understand about this. I think cannabis is cannabis. It's like aspirin or paracetamol. That's a bad example. But whatever. A single molecule. It's not. It's you know, two and a half thousand medicines. It's, it's not a single molecule and doesn't fit into the pharmaceutical model, as I'll come to later, it does not lend itself to double-blind placebo-controlled studies. I'll say that again, it does not lend itself to double-blind placebo-controlled studies. So the Royal College of Physicians in the UK, I won't be rude to your Royal College of Physicians, I don't know what their view is, but ours is hopeless. And they just, they offer opinions from on high that are not based on any fact at all. I'm getting, I'm drifting into Boris Johnson political territory again, aren't I? But, um, so there's an awful lot of different cannabis families, and I won't go through what all they are, uh, some of them are familiar to you, 
Uh, they've got sorts of wonderful names, and I think for medicine we do have to slightly change the names as we go on. We, you know, I don't think you'll be, as doctors, you won't want to hugely be prescribing AK-47 three times a day for your grandmother, um, <laughs> let alone some of the more entertaining names um, that we'll go through. But there are a whole variety of seeds. You stick the seed in a pot. I'm not, I'm not meant to, am I meant to be telling you how to grow cannabis in this thing or not? Anyway, it's not difficult. You stick the seed in the pot, up pops the shoot, and then over a varying period of time, vegetative phase, it grows like any other plant. I don't think that bit's too difficult, actually. You just stick it in the pot and it grows. Thank God there's no growers in the audience. They'd probably shoot me by now. I think it's a lot more complicated than that. But the vegetative phase takes, for those who don't grow it, um, it varies a lot uh, of two to three months, if not more, of vegetative phase. It varies a lot from species to species and what you're growing it in, um, where you're growing it, indoors, outdoors, etc., etc., etc. In the natural world, it then begins to um, produce the flower. And that use that is, they're photosensitive generally, Ruderalis isn't, but the others are, um, with a light phase change. So longer days, you get the vegetative phase, and when it changes roughly to 12 hour day, it's 12 hour night, that triggers the flowering. So what they do in greenhouses is to trigger the flowering, they change the lighting. So you get the lighting shift from long days to 12 hour days, and that then triggers the flowering. Um, and that will take another month or so for the flowers to mature. And what they want to do is produce, um, reduce the light cycle, as I've said. You want to produce uh, female flower heads, unfertilized female flower heads. So what they do is get rid of the males. They often then clone the female plant and just grow female plants and keep them well away from the males. The males in this context are useless. Many of the females in the audience might agree with that. Uh, but in this case, males are not helpful. Uh, because if you have a fertilized female flower head, it has much less um, uh, cannabinoids in them. So they want an unfertilized female flower head called Cincimella. Uh, and there they are. And on the Cincimella, oh, this is just the cannabinoids. There's none in the seed except if it sticks to it. Thank you for that. Um, virtually nothing in the roots. Very tiny amounts of, this is the amount of cannabinoids. Tiny amounts in the stem. A little bit more in the leaves, and look at the seeded, seeded, uh, fertilized female, 6.3%, uh, un unseeded, unfertilized female flower, 16%. So that's, that's why you want the unfertilized female flower head, because it has a lot more. That's called ganja or cincimella. A lot of cannabis um, terminology that I didn't until recently uh, know what it all meant. Uh, so that's what you need. And there, on the Unfertilized female flower as the trichomes. They are the chemical factors. That's where the cannabis and the phytocannabinoids is contained, in the trichomes that stick on the female flower head. So what you do, you've got your plant, it's grown, uh, it's got the trichomes on it, and basically all you need to do, you can, you, that can be the end of the story. You can take the female flower head, you can grind it up and smoke it as a joint. That, that could be it. But for medicines, generally, we want to extract the cannabinoids from those trichomes and extract the, the phytocannabinoids and the terpenes and the flavonoids and everything else and make various forms of different medicines and different oils. So how do we do that? It's not a lesson in how to extract from cannabis, but you can do it by, it's sticky. So you can do it by hand. You can just rub your hand over it and it sticks to your hand. That's not hugely um, efficient in terms of when you have the big Canadian guys have 100,000 plus square feet, there'll be a lot of people walking up and down getting sticky hands. So that's not very efficient, but you can do it that, they are sticky. Um, you can cold extract, you simply put it in a bucket of, uh, this is how you do it at home, you stick it in a bucket of cold water, that extracts the trichomes, uh, uh, separates it from the rest of the plant material, and then you can uh, uh, get it out of the cold water basically. You can heat it and press it, and that produces Rossine. Rossine, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, thank you. Um, mainly, then, you can extract it under alcohol. That's what most home growers do. Many will blow themselves up in their own kitchens doing so. Um, uh, butane, butane hash oil, BHO, or uh, dimethyl ether hash oil, DHO, under ethanol. So basically, you put the plant, this is very crude, because I haven't never done it myself, honestly. Um, you put it in alcohol, ethane, butane or ethanol, that uh, the, the trichomes dissolve in that, 
you get rid of the plant material and then you slowly heat up and the, uh, the ethanol um, evaporates off, leaving you with the purified uh, oil underneath it, if you like, as a result of that process. What they do in industrial terms is do the same sort of principle with supercritical carbon dioxide. So most of the big Canadian producers use supercritical CO2, same principle. You, you, you know, get the uh, trichomes off in the liquid CO2 and then you heat it up and the CO2 evaporates, leaving you with the um, extraction behind. Um, how you do that uh, does result in different, uh, uh, different formulations from the same plant. So it depends how you do it. You may have different quantities of terpenes, different quantities of cannabinoids, different variations uh, from the same plant. So this is a critical part. It's all about growing the plant with that particular variety, but it's how you extract also has a particular bearing on the final medicine. Okay, uh, you can, since Amado mentioned hashish is just, a, a, a keef is a, if you uh, sieve it basically, if you press keef together, that produces hashish in blocks, which I'm sure is familiar to you all. Um, uh, bang is uh, used in India cultures, and a, that's been used for centuries. That's an old picture of using bang, as they call it, in, in India. But the final content depends, therefore, not just on the strain, which have been 2,500 different strains, strains high in CBD, you might want, strains high in THC, a mixture of both. That's the fundamental difference. It depends on the growing conditions. I was talking to growers about this. It depends on how close the plants are to each other. It depends on whether you're growing outdoors or under a greenhouse. The height of the greenhouse, the best uh, greenhouse height, I'm told, is Dutch, which is uh, several meters high. You get better air circulation. I hope this is all right. If people know what the, if people differ, differ with what I'm saying, please say so. But I think that's right. It depends on the greenhouse. It depends on... Um, the height of the greenhouse, as I said, depends on the light conditions, clearly, because that depends when you trigger the flowering, and the, the earlier you flower, it's a different composition from later flowering. Um, the time you harvest it, when you actually pick the, the buds, and then the extraction. So there's a lot of complexities there, which you sort of have to know about uh, to determine what's the actual final composition of the medicine. It's not that complicated from our point of view because probably in the early days of New Zealand we're going to, going to have a, a handful of products available. So when, but when you get more refined, as they are now in some of the states, uh, Colorado and uh, California for example, it gets, you get a more refined product and you have to know a little bit more about that refinement. But at the moment I think it's true to say that it doesn't matter hugely because it's going to be dictated by what's available. Like Tilray I gather is available at the moment with three varieties. And that's it. So you haven't got to think about this complexity as yet. So that's what the final contact depends on. And then you mix it with the carrier oil, because uh, it's very concentrated, uh, the extraction. And you put it so you get a better volume. It's easier to take. And you mix it then usually with medium chain triglycerides. And that can be olive oil or peanut oil, hemp seed oil, grape seed oil, coconut oil, and, and others as well. Carrier oil uh, it matters, because there are sometimes uh, you get allergies, in fact, to the, some of the carrier oils. Um, the one, Epidiolex, for example, is not available here yet from GW Pharma, which is pure CBD, 99.99%, I believe, uh, is carried in a, as a sort of strawberry-flavored carrier, and some children are allergic to that. So the allergy to cannabis is actually very rare, uh, and it's often, if you get an allergic reaction, which is rare, it's usually to the carrier oil. Peanuts, for example, when people have peanut allergy, you don't want it in peanut oil. Okay, so a little bit of a summary. Um, two main components we're going to talk about next, THC and CBD and what they do. Um, we're going to talk about whether it's psychoactive and whether that's the right time. Is the pole plant more effective? We're going to cover that now uh, than the, component, the individual components, the so-called entourage effect I'm going to come to in a moment. We've got to remember the terpenes and flavonoids, which I'm going to come to as well. And we've already covered the last one, the flowering head has most phytocannabinoids, less in leaves and stems and none, effectively none, in the seed and the root. So let's have a look now at those actual phytocannabinoids. Now you know how to grow the stuff, um, we're going to look at what's in it. Uh, just, a, just as a side, don't bother to look at all this, but just as a reminder really that cannabis is not just a medicine. Industrial hemp particularly, as we said earlier, the big tall sativa varieties have a major use um, as a whole load of different things. Um, 
I'm told, I might sound to be corrected, but Henry Ford's first car was built out of hemp. Is that right? Thank you. It is right. Uh, there's hempcrete, which is a very effective uh, building material. That's a concrete-like. Um, you can see there it's used for uh, animal feeds, for example. It's used in soap. Hemp seed oil is, is perfectly healthy stuff. It doesn't contain phytocannabinoids, uh, but nevertheless it's perfectly healthy as a soap, a shampoo, blah, blah. Industrial products like oil with some varnishes, printing inks. You can read for the, all that for yourself. But basically, cannabis sativa as industrial hemp is a remarkably useful and versatile product. Uh, so we shouldn't forget that that also has a value out with the phytocannabinoids that we're going to come to in a moment. Right. These are the ones that are psychoactive. Now, psychoactive, I'm not sure, is the right phrase. Because it's said that the CBD, for example, is not psychoactive. I think that if it has a, 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 an effect on the brain, it's psychoactive. Yes. I think the better word is intoxicating. So THC is intoxicating, whereas the CBD and the other ones around it are not intoxicating. I think that's a better definition. But the, the sort of world knows it as psychoactive or non-psychoactive. I don't think that's accurate. Another word I use is euphoria. Yes, it's, it gives you the high. So yes, whatever. CBD is non-euphoric. Exactly. THC is not the only intoxicating psychoactive component of the plant. THC itself is like an antamide, is a partial agonist of CB1 and CB2, but it also has an effect on other receptors, like 5-HT, glycine, GPR55, which I mentioned earlier, as are, to varying degrees, the other psychoactive components. Delta-8 is also a partial agonist of CB1, for example. What is it? It's analgesic. That's primarily. It's the primary thing you need for pain. CBD is also pain-killing. I should mention that. I'll come to that in a moment. It's anti-itch. Uh, it's bronchodilatory, not well known. It's actually quite good for chronic obstructive airway disease. You'd think that smoking anything isn't, but actually cannabis is. It's neuroprotective, as I mentioned earlier. This is just THC in isolation. Uh, it's antioxidant, it's a muscle relaxant, it's anti-emetic. As I said before, it's 20 times the power of aspirin and twice of uh, steroids and hydrocortisone. It's anti-inflammatory effects. So it has a remarkable range of effects, just THC. So THC definitely has medical properties in its own right. We shouldn't forget, I said earlier, the synthetic THC, nebulone and drabinol, but they're not as, I think there's no, that's not controversial, they're not as effective as the natural. Why, you ask? If it's a chemical, it's a chemical, it's a chemical. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. My guess is that mainly if you use uh, plant-based CBD, it does have a whole range of other minor cannabinoids and terpenes in it, even if they're a tiny proportion, um, and they have, they, they have the uh, enlarging entourage effect as a role. Uh, these are the non-psychoactive or non-intoxicating or non-euphoriant uh, bits in the plant. The one we've all heard of is CBD, cannabidiol. That is, for those of you who understand, don't mean to be rude, but I didn't look it up. It's an inverse agonist of CB2, and it's a CB1 antagonist. Now, the advantage of that is, uh, very crudely, if you have put CBD in, it counteracts some of the effect of THC. Uh, so, for example, so Sativex is 50% CBD, 50% THC. You spent 50% THC will be wildly psychoactive, but it's not at all. Sativex doesn't get you high because it's counteracted by the CBD. So in medical cannabis usage, we would tend to start with CBD and then add in some THC later. We'll come to all this this afternoon. Um, so CBD counteracts some of that, uh, for medical purposes, some of the undesirable, some may say it's desirable, but some undesirable effects of the, the psychoactive, the intoxicant effects, are counteracted by CBD because it is antagonistic to that receptor <coughs> and other receptors. Cannabichromine cannabigerol, I'll come to in a moment, most of the others, most of the others are non-intoxicating. But what does CBD do in its own right, in isolation? That's what it looks like. It is also neuroprotective. It's anti-anxiety, whereas THC is, is the opposite. It tends to be anxiogenic. Overdose of, of cannabis makes you anxious. Overdose of CBD doesn't. It's anti-anxiety and has a role as an anti-anxiety medicine. It's very good as an anti-anxiety medicine, and anti-psychotic, incidentally. Anti-convulsant, um, particularly. There are others that are anti-convulsant, but CBD, that's the one you hear most of. The little boy called Alfie Dingley in the UK was the one who changed the law in the UK. Uh, 
um, he was using CBD to stop 500 seizures a month to zero seizures a month. And he got a, um, actually about 80% improvement on CBD, and he got the other 20% with a tiny little bit of THC added in. It's also cytotoxic to some forms of breast cancer. It is sedative in high doses. I think those who've used it would agree with me. It's generally not, but it, it can be a bit sedative in higher doses, and it's generally not uh, intoxicating. So basically I put that up to say CBD has really good medical properties in its own right. And it's available as an isolate, as epidiolix, but as I say, the isolated forms are not as good in my view as the whole plant forms. I'm very clear about that. Um, and so is GW Pharma, incidentally. They finally admitted uh, that they, they've gone down the pharmaceutical route of producing isolates, and I understand why. Uh, but they now say that actually the full plant is more efficacious than individual components. So, that's all very nice and simple. THC does this, CBD does that. It's not that simple. It gets more interesting. This is where they come from. The, the primary cannabinoid in the plant is called CBG. Why has it got an A after it? Because the plant produces these cannabinoids in acidic precursor form, which are not Psychoactive, let's, let's just use that phrase for a moment. It's not psychoactive. So you see films of people uh, running through fields and eating raw cannabis and getting high from it. You don't. You can eat as much raw cannabis as you like, should you feel moved to do so, uh, because it's not psychoactive. It's in the form of the acidic precursor. The acidic precursors are not psychoactive. And that has relevance, because THCA can be used as an anticonvulsant for reasons I'll come to later. What you have to do to get these active is decarboxylate them. You have to take the carboxyl ring off, and you do that uh, either by heating, I think it's 180 degrees for uh, about half an hour, gas mark four. Do people do, is that right? That's good. thank you very much. You put it, literally put it in the oven, you heat it, and that decarboxylate it, or light, or time, probably is an accumulation of both. Um, and that activates it. So that's an important thing to note if you're prescribing flour um, and uh, for people might want to put it in food, it's not active until you decarboxylate it. If you buy medicine, it's already decarboxylated for you. And of course, if you, heat, if you vape the flour, the heat will decarboxylate it. But if you're using the raw flour for other purposes, it is not active until you decarboxylate it. So the primary thing is CBGA, cannabigerol, acidic broken down into those three, THC we talked about, CBD we talked about, and CBC, kind of chromine, in the acidic form. You then decarboxylate them to, just chop the A off, CBG, CBC, CBD, THC. Okay? But all the cannabinoids ever studied are, have medical properties, all of them. There's 144 at the last count. A lot we don't know much about, in fairness, but we do know something about maybe 15 or 20 of those, there's a long way to go yet. Um, so what do these do? Look at, look at the primary one, CBG. It in itself it has anti-cancer properties. It's anti-inflammatory. It has effects on the bladder over, over activity. It has effect on glaucoma. It's antibacterial and appetite stimulant. There's a whole range of stuff just from CBG. And you can get varieties. Now they're high in CBG. These are the, if you like, recreational varieties that are high in CBG for what it's worth. Uh, Mickey Cush. Um, Magic Jordan, all sorts of weird names, but they're relatively speaking high in CBG. <coughs> so it has medical properties. THCA, which is not psychoactive, as we've heard about, that has medical, that's, anti that's a very useful anticonvulsant. And uh, I'm Alfie's doctor, and uh, uh, he can't tolerate THC. A lot of the children can't tolerate much THC. Even if it's counteracted by CBD, he can't tolerate more than three minutes his permission to talk about this, uh, three milligrams of THC, so we're using now THCA, which is anticonvulsant, but is not psychoactive. It's anti-sickness, and it's analgesic. CBDA, oh, I'm just showing these as examples, not to, to boringly go through every medical property of every phytocannabinoid, uh, but it just shows you the, the, the sort of richness, I suppose, of the plant. And CBC, Again, it has interesting uh, different properties. It has a very good effect on acne and is one of the few that are known to be antidepressant. Interestingly, depression is the second most common use, medical use, 
illegal medical use of cannabis, at least in the UK, uh, but there's, there's virtually no studies of its antidepressant effect, inter interestingly. Um, none, or virtually none. But uh, CBC is anti uh, antidepressant and has a very good effect on acne as an anti-inflammatory. So there's a whole load of interesting things. And then we just have a look at CBN, the breakdown product of THC, if you remember. This also has a lot of properties. You can read them for yourself there. I won't read them out. Uh, but it's subtly different from its uh, uh, originator, THC. And there are varieties that are high in CBN. And THC actually degrades into CBN. So an old, out-of-date THC product will contain mainly CBN. The varine pathway, I've nearly finished. Hang, hang with me. CBG, exactly the same with the V in it. CBG, VA, THC, VA, etc., etc. And the one to mention here particularly is this one, THC, VA, uh, which is a CB1 antagonist. It's also the one that seems to have most of the anti uh, slowing down of dementia effect in Alzheimer's models and uh, is anticonvulsant as well. But Mainly, <coughs> we want to look at medically the ratio between THC and CBD. That's what I'll come to this afternoon. That's the key ratio, as far as we understand it at the moment. But I just wanted to mention those other things. How are we doing? We've got seven minutes. No need to panic. But I do want to mention terpenes. Terpenes are, uh, cannab cannabinoids are smellless. But you walk along, walk along here, um, these days, it's amazing how you can be attuned to the smell of cannabis. The smell of cannabis is the terpenes and not the phytocannabinoids. These are things that give us its characteristic slight sweet, sweet, sickly smell, but clearing out proportions, when I come to these in more detail. Uh, but these are six of those that are commonest. Limonene, not surprisingly, is, these are compounds found in the plant kingdom overall. So this is found in lemons, terpenes and flavonoids, and then we're going to have a, a, a person. So, limonene smells of lemons, does that. Myrcene is quite sedative, which may be helpful for those who have difficulty sleeping at night. For example, it has a quite sedative, anti-inflammatory, analgesic as well. It's a thing with the smell of hops. Now, the beta caryophylline that's the uh, cloves. That's the one I've told you about. That's the one I'm t no one's ever corrected, so I assume it's right. This is what the sniffer dogs at airports are trained to detect, beta caryophylline. So if you want to smuggle things in through the airport, you need varieties that are, don't have any beta caryophylline in them, because then it will get past the sniffer dogs. Um, piney, not surprising, it gives the smell of pine. And pine is a very good bronchodilator. It's also antibiotic, but it also impairs memory. So there's some negative properties. I don't want to say they're all positive properties. Some of these have negative properties, an impairment of memory if it's high in pining. Uh, Linalu is uh, lavender anti-anxiety, it's very good local anaesthetic, and it's the one that also is anticonvulsant. And we've been trying recently to find a strain that is high in CBD, but also got quite a high proportion of linalool in it, because that is an additional anticonvulsant. Then there's the colour. Flavonoids you think give flavour, it doesn't give colour. Uh, and I won't go through this in any detail because it, gets a, it becomes a long list. But again, all the plant kingdom has these things. Look at the one on the right is the tomato, has quercetin, that's the red color of the tomato. And that interesting, is interesting, is antiviral properties, antioxidant, anti neoplastic um, as well. And uh, look at the apigen, apigenin. What's that picture of? Who? Artichoke, thank you. I couldn't think of the name. It's not broccoli. I don't know. Um, <laughs> it's anxiolytic, etc., etc. So there's about 50 flavonoids, there's about 100 terpenes, there's about 140 uh, cannabinoids. So actually, the combinations of all that run into the trillions.